a bit stronger. Come on, put your hands together for this pastor, Pastor Graves and Lady Graves on their 16th anniversary. Come on, you can do better than that. You can do better than that. Some people didn't make it 16 days. Some people didn't make it 16 minutes. 16 minutes. So God be the glory. All that he has done. Y'all don't even act like we came out of a pandemic. And we're still able to have church. When the devil tried to close the building, the church was still open. I come to honor my moderator, my brother, my friend, and I come with gifts in hand. So let me get this out of the way. Pastor Greg, come get this money before I spend it. This is from Nia Fellowship Baptist Church. And another envelope, envelope from Lady Dr. Gwen Platt and I. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, Lady Grace. They are true dear friends of ours. And I want y'all to know something. We're going to look like them when we grow up. That is my brother. And she is my sister. And don't y'all mess with them. Because even though I'm in West Orange, I'm still from Newark. Come on. I'm looking for you. I won't come with what I used to have. I just come with some prayer. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost in the other hand. We thank God for being here. We thank God for all the clergy. All the clergy stand just to show the people, the clergy that has come out to support this man of God and this woman of God. We thank all the clergy and all who are my friends. We thank our former moderator, uh, Pastor Caldwell, who's, who's right, we've been friends for over 40 years, and, and God has blessed us individually. I thank God for the members who are here. I see a lot of my institute students who are here. Amen, from the Leadership Institute of New Hope. I'm glad to see you, glad to see my friends. And I want y'all to know, I'm struggling to get here. You know, I, I'm a, I told somebody, I told my brother, um, Pastor Thomas, as I was coming in, he said, oh, look, the pastor's here. I said, yeah, it's been a little struggle. I had to drop people off at the door, you know. You know, I, I said, I'm not, I'm not a mega pastor, but I'm a major pastor. <laughs> you know, I don't have all of the bodyguards and the adjutants and, you know, all of those things that they have today, armor bearers. But I do have with me, now let me help y'all. Don't mess with me. I got my 95-year-old dad here with me. The Reverend Green will tell you, he don't... We don't take no tea for the evil. So when, when I pull up with him, you know he better be ready. You know, back in the day, he used to be a good shot. But they said now, a bad shot might get you at least hit in the ear. But I digress. I, I digress. Thank God for him being here. My sister Carol is here with me. And the love of my life for 36 years, lady, Dr. I thank God for my church. Those of you who are from Nia, please stand and let them know that you're here and you're in support of the business service. Thank God for our musicians, our choir. You know, it's hard to come to church in the summer for black folk. I saw y'all had food. Y'all know how to keep some people here. Huh? <laughs> you let them go out, they might not make it home. I told the told preacher in the office, he said, oh, sit down, relax. I said, no, bro, I just ate. <laughs> if I get on the corner of this couch, I might not get up. So I thank God that you would uh, call me to be the one to preach. There's so many preachers here who can preach this, this service and, and be here. But I thank God that I've been the one who has been called. And, you know, time has been well spent, so let's get to the Word of God. All right. Devil's already busy with me and, uh, you know, trying to mess with me with my sermon, but we ain't going to let him win. And I think he is messing with me because of what I'm going to preach. Let's go to Matthew, the fifth chapter, starting at the 13th verse. Matthew, the fifth chapter, starting at the 13th verse. If you don't have your Bible, guess what? You really have it. You just don't know it. Because you got your phone, you've been scrolling through the whole service. So just scroll on to Matthew 5. 
Just Google it, you know. Uh, go to Safari, whatever you got to do. You got the word. Matthew 5, starting at verse 13. I'll be reading from the Good News Translation. If you would, bear with us and just stand as we give reverence to the reading of the word of God before it's preached. And the word of the Lord reads, You are the salt for the whole human race. You, but of salt, loses its saltiness. There is no way to make it salty again. It has become worthless, so it is thrown out and people trample on it. You are like light for the whole world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl. Instead, it is put on the lampstand where it gives light for everyone in the house. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. And the word of the Lord is blessed. I come to preach to you from the subject, don't let the opposition win. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, I thank you for this awesome responsibility called preaching. God, I know I've dressed for the occasion and come and tried to look accordingly, but you know my inside. Yeah. They see the outside, but you know me true and true and complete. Mm. But I thank you because I believe that you've called me for a time such as this. Mm. So God I ask that you would stand up and sit me down. Mm. Hide me behind the cross so that the people can see you and not me. Mm. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in his presence. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. Don't let, don't let the, opposition the opposition win. In Bible study a few years ago, we used the book by Bishop Brandon Porter entitled, It's Time to Be Filled. Concerned about the Holy Spirit and concerned about the Holy Ghost and trying to get a better understanding of it, you know, because we, we will mess it up in a minute because folks will say, did you catch the Holy Ghost at church? And I said, I didn't know they were throwing it anywhere. You know, we, we have to get people to understand that these emotional breakouts and spirits is not really what they call it, the Holy Ghost. We have to help them to understand it's already in you. All you got to do is turn the ignition on and get it going. Now, one lesson that stayed in my mind was the lesson on fulfilling our role despite, in spite of the opposition. Brandon Porter reminds us uh, to not let our God-given gift or talent deceive us, watch this, into thinking that everyone with us is, everyone is with us in our walk with God. He argues that if you are truly being used by God, People will oppose you. Oh, I know that's tough to take. Nobody knows this better than a pastor, especially one who has truly received the gift of the call to preach and teach. And as much as we cherish and thank God for pastors, we must also recognize that pastors have a difficult assignment because of the constant opposition pastors face in the natural and in the spiritual. Pastors are challenged by opposition in much of the same way athletes are challenged. So that's why the Apostle Paul often compares scripture and in scripture our challenges as Christians with the challenges athletes face as they attempt to win a race or are in competition. Pastors and congregations have been facing an unexpected opposition for a little more than four years now. The enemy launched a devastating attack on the church in March 2020. Mm. The pandemic came and exposed an opposition that existed in the body of Christ that no one wanted to acknowledge. Right. Until the pandemic opposition existed, as until then the pandemic, when it came, until then, opposition existed as the big elephant in the room. The pandemic revealed to us our own reality series, Pastor Graves. I call it Pandemic Life. 
And we should all thank God for another chance in this series. And not a second chance, but another chance. Because it's clear to me more now than ever that we are still here because we all have more work to do for God. If you ever wondered why you, why you didn't leave here, why are you still here? It's because you still have more work to do for God. I, I know some of you might have said some of that crazy stuff like when you lost a loved one. Lord, you should have took me instead of, you know, we just kind of say that kind of stuff. But God is saying to us that you didn't leave here. You were no better than the ones who actually left here. But I still got some work for you to do in my kingdom. If not, we would have left here with no warning like so many of our loved ones who left here during the pandemic. And as I was preparing for the sermon, I was reminded in my spirit that all pastors are trying to fulfill their role in the post-pandemic world despite the opposition we face in this day and time. Pastors are bleeding and leading at the same time. Yeah. Pastors are wounded shepherds because uh, the way we used to do church is gone and will never, ever, ever, ever return. I know some of y'all are looking for the good old days. Uh, let's go back to the day coming back. We have to move forward and we have to continue to press forward. Pastors still have to lead and be challenged because of those who lead are not always fulfilling their roles. Yeah, yeah, you, you always talk about what is the pastor doing. Sometimes you got to get in that mirror and say, what am I doing? I need you to know this afternoon that in order for pastors to gain strength, they need to see those who are leading beside them and showing their strength in handling the opposition. We, we need to look. I tell my people all the time, it's not about the pastor pushing the people. The people need to push the pastors. The ministries shouldn't have to be pushed by the pastors. The ministry should be pushing the pastors because the pastors are the ones who are in the front. And if they can see that they got some, I'm talking to somebody, somebody in here. Uh, I, okay, I'm from the hood and if I'm going to a fight, I need to know I got some people behind me. I need to know I can turn around and I don't have a bunch of scared folk talking a whole lot of talk, but then when it's time to put your hands up, you look around and they are all gone. Pastors need an Aaron and they need a her in their life to help them lift their hands and use their gift to lead people in the ways of Christ. Aaron and her understood that Moses had a pact with God. They made no attempt, watch this, to assume Moses' role. Uh-oh. Because some people think they can just jump in, assume Moses' role in holding the staff. But instead, they assisted Moses by lifting his arms for him. The weight gets heavy sometimes. It's hard to always lift, but I come to tell you, some of y'all should be excited about weight. I've been teaching this to my people for about 20 years. We need some weight in our life if we want to get stronger. Oh, y'all didn't know that. Oh, y'all just think you walk in the gym and you look at the weights and you get stronger. Somebody told me you got to lift some weights. Uh, uh, Pastor Thomas, I think even not only just lift the weight, sometimes you got to have a spotter in back of you uh, yeah. telling you to just push uh, and I catch it just in case you can't push it up. Uh, but if you lift enough weight uh, and you do it often enough, sooner or later what was heavy becomes light. Uh, oh, your burden that you've been dealing with, if you just keep pushing and keep pushing and, and keep pushing. Uh, I got some athletes in here. You know the muscle begins to grow. Uh, and what used to be heavy is not heavy anymore. Yeah. Lifted Moses' arms. Their trust in God and their faith in Moses led to God's people prevailing in battle. The actions of Aaron and her represent what we can do to prevail when we want to win, to prevail when we have conflict against the enemy. Let me just call him who he is, because I know he's in here somewhere. When we got conflict from the devil, when we got conflict. 
conflict from Satan because he got dressed up and he ate too. Let me tell you that. But he didn't know somebody was going to come and get in his face and say, I know you here and I'm going to call you out because we're not going to let you hold us captive. A leader only gets stronger when they see the growth in the ones around them that they are leading. Uh, this pastoral celebration is something, y'all. Y'all might take it for granted, uh, but I'm glad to be back in church on a Sunday afternoon uh, and I don't have to wear no mask. I'm glad to be back in church uh, where I can breathe uh, and say glory be to God and hallelujah without taking off the mask and wiping my face and put it back on. I'm glad that God has made a way out of no way and some leaders here at Clearway uh, said regardless of the times uh, we will honor our angel of our church uh, and show him that his work is appreciated yeah. that's what today is about we're honoring you pastor and let you know even though you don't think it sometimes you know because we are our own worst enemy your work is appreciated do I have any witnesses here yeah. Somebody needs to just give God a hand clap of praise for just making this day happen. This is the day that the Lord has made. I don't know about you, but I come to rejoice and be glad in it. Old folk used to say, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to serve the Lord. And if you get with me a little bit, we might shout together. But you don't have to shout with me because I can dance by myself. I don't need to have no house music to give God the glory. All I need to do is think about the goodness of God and all he's done for me and that there's some leaders in the place leading me to be where I need to be. That's all I need to do and I'll jump a little bit. I'll dance a little bit. I might do the moonwalk if I have to. This is about the office of the pastorate because if God calls him home, the office is still going to be open and we need to thank God that he placed a leader that can take us to where we need to go. I mean, now my theologian, resident theologian, Pastor Clegg is in the house. He's wondering where I'm going, but I'm in the text, Pastor. In the text, we find Jesus speaking in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, where he shares in the Beatitudes what true happiness really is. He identifies who who is really blessed as he mocks some of the naysayers and <laughs> he's mocking these jokers on the hill. I don't know, they might have been Republican or something, I don't know. <laughs> these well-to-do people in the crowd. He even shares as he concludes in verses 11 and 12 that our persecution should be considered, watch this, a reward because the prophets before us endured the same things. Yeah. Oh, we should be shouting, y'all. Last Sunday I got up and I, before I preached in the afternoon over at my brother Greenwood's church, Pastor Greenwood's church and I told him that Joe Biden had just dropped out of the race. Everyone went, woo. Ooh, but they forgot that God put something behind him uh, that was a little bit more viral, that had a little bit more attack. Uh, and the worst thing you can do if a black man fall is let a black woman come behind him. Uh, now a white man fell, but now a black woman coming behind him. Uh, he's scared. Oh, they scared. If he ain't scared, he need to talk to me. I don't want no black woman coming behind, coming after me. He got prosecutors out the woodworks. One in New York, one in Georgia. Now he got one running against him. He need to give his life to the Lord and ask him to make a way. Lord, have mercy. I'm still there, Pastor Clegg. First, he addresses the need for disciples of Jesus to live accordingly to the virtues described in the Beatitudes. These are needed in order to be salt and light in the world. Jesus says to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. During that time, we need to understand, as it is now, salt served a variety of functions before the days of refrigeration. Salt was used widely as a preservative by rubbing it into the meat. You know I got some old cooks in here. Y'all know what salt does. In some cases it can be used as a kind of fertilizer. It was also used to bring flavor. Somebody say flavor. 
flavor to the food. Jesus' call for followers to be salt of the earth carries those uses symbolically into our spiritual lives. As salt preserves meat from rotting, believers in Jesus distributed uh, distributed around the world help to preserve humanity from falling into godliness, godlessness, uh, to immorality, chaos, uh, and resulting judgment. Salt permanently changes the flavor of food just as the influence of godly people can change a culture. Didn't y'all know y'all were culture changers? We don't come here just to make noise because we want to holler. We holler because we want to change somebody's life. We worship because we want people to change. We want Avon Avenue to change and 13th Street to change. We want Newark to change. And if they keep changing their change all the way up to West Orange, we want people to change. The main point is that the Christians serve a godly purpose in the world simply by living out what we believe about Jesus. It's just that easy. If we would just live what we shout about. Yeah, some of y'all get that when you get home. Since you're doing all that shouting, if you ain't going to live when you get home. All that shouting in church and talking about and quoting scripture, you get home and you start acting a fool. And your children, grandchildren, remember how you were acting in church and they say, what's wrong with them? And they see you over in the corner talking about, go get that, go get me my Bible, huh? Uh, that's under that Hennessy Bible. <laughs> Got it all twisted up. Christians stop serving uh, the purpose when they stop living in faithfulness to God. The re recent references to the Beatitude put that purpose into context. I dug a little deeper. When Jesus' followers stop being poor in the spirit, living in repentance and meekness, and having an appetite for righteousness and being merciful, they stop serving their purpose on earth. This is just a catastrophic and unthinkable as if salt was to lose its flavor. Let me talk to some people with high blood pressure. <laughs> my God, my God. The doctor said you couldn't have salt no more. You thought it was the end of the world. You were praying for some supplements to come along the way. I need some little flavor in my food. It's nothing like having food that just don't taste good. And it's not that the food wasn't made good, but it didn't have any flavor to it. One writer said that uh, that some object, uh, an object to of this metaphor by saying that salt never loses its saltiness. He, he said, according to chemistry, you know, some of my science people, salt never loses its, its flavor, according to chemistry. He argues that this misses the point and is not true in a practical sense. Jesus' teaching can be taken to mean, in part, that certain qualities are as innate to a born-again believer as saltiness is to salt. The idea of losing those properties is unthinkable. In a more practical sense, the salt which people use daily was not chemically pure. It could be diluted or even contaminated. That would result in something that was supposed to be salt, but didn't taste or act like salt anymore. That made it useless and subject to disposal. Y'all better be careful about not using your flavor because they say if you don't use it, what's gonna happen? You're gonna lose it. Jesus indicates uh, the same can happen to a disciple who stops living faithfully to Christ in the world. The point here is not about loss of salvation, but a loss of purpose. Uh, bad salt isn't destroyed or burnt. Uh, it's simply ignored along with the dust of the earth. Uh, I came today to share just a word uh, on this pastor's anniversary. Uh, I'm getting excited myself. Uh, hopefully it will help you to help your pastor lead in a time such as this. Uh, in order for pastors to lead, the church has to help them do three things. Y'all ready for these three things? Told you, Pastor Clegg, I'm back because I got them, I got them, I got them. These three things because pastors are still 
still leading while bleeding. So pastors are wounded shepherds and they have to do three things. Number one, they got to view the opposition. You got to know what, what the opposition is. Uh, number two, you got to face the opposition. Uh, after you done viewed it, uh, you got to face it. Uh, Thomas, you know what that's like. Uh, you know, I grew up with your cousin that would go out in the school not too far from here. Uh, and when it was time to fight, uh, you got to know who you're going to fight. Uh, and then at some point, you got to step up and be ready to face them in the fight. Uh, and number three, but most of all, before you face them, uh, you better know the opposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll say it again. Y'all write notes. Uh, number one, view the opposition. Number two, face the opposition. And Number three, know the opposition. Uh, when we view the opposition, we should feel favored because of our gift from God. Uh, we are all gifted in the body of Christ. Uh, we just have to identify and claim our gifts. Uh, the confirmation of that comes uh, as the text tells us that we are salt of the earth uh, and that we are like the light of the world. Uh, the church has to help the pastors by viewing the opposition with him uh, as he leads. He's the pastor. I'm going to help y'all, you know, because we have female pastors too. So you got to view the opposition with the pastor as they lead. When we view the opposition, we should feel favored because our work is for the Lord. Feeling Feeling favored helps because there will be times when people will not appreciate your gift or what you have to offer. That opposition should not affect you if you are using your gift for Christ. Uh, when you use your gift for Christ, uh, there is a great reward waiting for you. I preached last Sunday, your, your, your reward is waiting for you. Uh, God will reward your faithfulness. Uh, the reality is that only what you do for Christ uh, will last. Uh, you have to do what Paul said. Uh, you have to press toward the mark of the high calling in Jesus Christ. Uh, despite the opposition, uh, you've got to keep on. I'm moving forward. Uh, I got some, some people here from the south. Uh, you know what it's like riding up 95 uh, and the rain starts to come. Uh, as they said, it starts raining cats and dogs. Uh, Y'all been traveling back and forth. Y'all know that, right? Uh, oh, you know the rule of the road is you don't just stop because uh, all it's going to do is rain on you. But you creep a little bit uh, and you move a little further because you know if you press toward the mark where you're going, uh, that sooner or later the rain is going to be behind you uh, and you can move a little faster. You can move a little safer. Next, the church has to help the pastor face the opposition. As the church helps the pastor face the opposition, we must remember that our gifts are not for us, but for others. I'll say that again. Yeah. Our gifts are not for us, but they're for others. Pastors use their gifts in many ways, such as preaching, teaching, praying, counseling, ministering, evangelizing, encouraging, and loving as they pour into the lives of people. The church has to help the pastor use his gifts or her gifts effectively and understand that the same people who talk about you or the pastor will be the same people who may be the benefactors from what you or the pastor's gift brings their way. Talking about the pastor and saying this or that but yet being blessed by the pastor's gift. I'm the wrong one, baby. Don't come talking to me about no pastor. Because I'm going to lay you out. Because if you are sitting under the pastor, then you need to not talk about him. You need to pray about him if something is not going right. Folks still talking about church hurt. I told them last week, uh, we all talk about church hurt so we don't show up in church. Uh, but I learned some way. Ain't nobody talking about bar hurt. And they still go. The goal is to reach just one person for Christ. Uh, my sister Pastor McKay taught me that. She said each one, reach one, uh, is just icing on the cake. Uh, oh, when we reach more than one is icing on the cake, uh, as evident as the day of Pentecost uh, after Peter's message, uh, 3,000 souls came to the Lord. Uh, why do you think they came? Uh, they came because they saw something different and they saw something new uh, and they saw a body of people who were together and they could not help with her. You know, it was like Jeremiah with fire shut up in his bones. Uh, they had to keep coming, keep coming, keep coming because they saw that the people were blessed. Uh, this morning I talk about not forsaking the sibling of yourselves. Uh, why? Because if we go to 
the church and we get involved in church and we work in the church and people see that happening, guess what? People will come because it looks like something's happening. Come on, downtown wasn't filled on yesterday afternoon with a house fest and people dancing because only two people were dancing. No, 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 it was word of mouth and one person did the boogaloo, everybody was doing the boogaloo. And if you act like that in church, maybe they fill up the church like they fill up the park. I know some of y'all my age, I know what the boogaloo is anyway. <laughs> Finally, most of all, know the opposition. As the church helps the pastor know the opposition, you don't always need to know who said what about someone else or who said what about you. Guess what? Uh, what people say about you ain't none of your business anyway. That's what they want to say. God bless them. Say what you want to say. They talk about Jesus. They even crucified him. So I must be doing something good. All we need to know is that God is an omnipresent God. God sees and knows everything we do and everything we do not do. Our job is to fast and pray in a positive manner and not be hindered by the fear of rejection. When we do what is right in the eyesight of God, he will make a way out of no way. I think I got some believers here who can testify to that. We must pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Uh, oh, let me say that. That's a little too sophisticated. That's a little West Orange for you. Uh, we got to pray for the guidance of the Holy Ghost. Jesus left the Holy Ghost with us uh, so that he would comfort us uh, and give us the strength that we need in all of our challenges. Uh, the Holy Ghost is a he. Somebody say a he. A he. It's not an it. The Holy Ghost is a he. He gives us power over the enemy. The word of the Lord tells us that we shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon us. Some of us ain't got no power because we ain't turned on the car yet. I saw a TikTok, a girl taking a driver's test, and she was just moving the gears and looking side to side, and the guy was sitting there as an instructor looking at her. She ain't even start up the car yet. The car can't move unless you start it up. The Holy Ghost can't move in you unless you ignite it and say, thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Well, as I close, I told y'all I'm done. I came to encourage my brother and encourage my sister and let them know that as long as we have the Holy Ghost, we can defeat the opposition. That's the key, y'all. Anybody know that? If you got the Holy Ghost, you can defeat the opposition. I don't know, maybe it's my Pentecostal church on my campus. We got a Pentecostal church. Oh, yeah, we got a holiness church, Pentecostal church, Baptist church, Haitian church, Spanish church. If y'all want to come do church, I'll come do church too. We got it all on our campus. And I came to let you know that the Holy Ghost needs to be in place. We are the salt of the earth. And that means, in the words of that thing, delay uh, who writes the CBN uh, you and I as Christians are called the soul of the earth because our lives enhance uh, and give meaning to the existence that we call life uh, before salvation uh, we were like grains of sand uh, too numerous to count uh, but after receiving Christ uh, we were transformed uh, no longer looking minuscule like minuscule debris uh, of a rock having little or no difference from one another or a lost piece of sand to something distinctive in taste, texture, aroma. If we are the salt of the earth and it's possible to lose our flavoring, then it's no secret the devil will do his best to make sure our effectiveness, our flavoring isn't what it used to be. That's what he's trying to do, y'all. The devil is trying to keep you from going around the corner because he knows that there is a blessing waiting for you. And I come to tell you it's time for you to turn the corner. If he had his way in every case, we'd have no flavoring left at all. Returning like transparent grains of sand with no threat to him or his kingdom. He has come to sift us. And how is he going to do it? He's trying to do it in the congregation. He's trying to do it in the association. He's trying to do it in the body of Christ. But I came to tell him, I told you he's here. Get thee behind me, Satan. You have no way in here. We can't always control every trial we face. But we must say, I am a keeper 
of my salt. Somebody say, I'm a keeper of my salt. I'm a keeper of my salt. Will I be bitter or better? Less seasoned or more flavorful? Will I disappear into the background or stand out as an overcomer? Because in the end, what good am I if I've lost my flavor? I came in here with a step, y'all. I came in here to move in a particular way. Yeah, I got swag. I got swag because I believe in God. Church, we are commissioned to pass the torch of Christ uh, for greater mission work. Uh, the devil has tried to blow out the torch. Uh, we cannot let the opposition win. Uh, somebody said, don't, don't let the opposition win. Uh, today we're here to defeat the opposition. Uh, celebrate what God has done for your pastor. Celebrate what God has done for pastor and people. Uh, it doesn't happen for everybody. Uh, every church is not open right now. Uh, some ended in the pandemic. Uh, it took pastor and people to make this thing work. We win when we praise God together. Don't let the opposition win. Continue to honor the office of the pastor. Don't let the opposition win. Stay focused and stay committed to the work of the Lord. Don't let the opposition win. There has been a great attack on the body of Christ for about four years now. If he didn't kill you, you still here. You got to keep saying, I'm going to work as long as it's still day. Satan is going after the head so he can destroy the whole body. Don't let the opposition win. Why, Pastor Platt? I'm glad you asked. I came to preach Jesus. Jesus didn't let the opposition win in the wilderness. Jesus didn't let the opposition win in the garden of Gethsemane. And he sure didn't let the opposition win on the cross. Do I have any witnesses here? Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I have the power to give it up and receive it back again. Just as the Father commanded me. On the cross, he defeated the opposition. When he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. On the cross, he defeated the opposition. When he said, today thou will be with me in paradise. On the cross, y'all didn't know he was fighting the opposition. He said, oh woman, behold thy son. Son, behold our mother. On the cross, he cried out, Lama Sabatini, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was defeating the opposition when he said, I thirst. He was defeating the opposition when he said, It is finished. And he defeated the opposition when he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I had to take you back to that little lesson because I get to the old preacher part. Because at the end, he died for you. He died for me. He defeated the opposition one more time. When the grave could not hold him down. Early one Sunday morning. He did not let the opposition win. So you got to pray for your pastor. Don't let the opposition win. You got to encourage your pastor. Don't let the opposition win. You got to help your pastor. Use your gift to bless the church. Help your pastor. Use your gift to let ministry move throughout the church. Let your gift make room for you. Use your flavor. Somebody say flavor. You got flavor. Use your flavor. Give God the glory. Use your flavor. Give God the honor. Use your flavor and give God all the praise. Whatever you do, don't let the opposition win. Because when Jesus got up, he got up with all power in his hand. Power to live right. Power to give right. Power to pray right. Power to serve right. I ain't going to let you win, devil. I see you running out the door. Because we're praising God. And when praises go up, blessings come down. I see a blessing over there. A blessing over there. A blessing right there. A blessing right there. Why? Because we ain't going to let the opposition win.